in order to cover the rear of Army Group A. The 4th Panzer Army had a twofold task. It was not to allow that the enemy following it could strike in the rear of the 1st Panzer Army until it has not withdrawn from the Caucasus to a new eastward-facing front. But at the same time it had to prevent the breakthrough along the lower reaches of the Don to Rostov the enemy, which would thus cut the communications of the 4th Panzer Army and Army Group A. It was clear that the army's forces would not be enough to block the enemy's advance all the territory from the lower Don to the northern foothills of the Caucasus. When the army was in the area of Kotelnikovo, in its composition after the defeat of the Romanians remained only 57 TK, with its two already badly damaged in the fighting divisions. 15 airfield division was still not in combat readiness, and 16 MD was not yet replaced near Elista troops of Army Group A. All the efforts of Army Group Don in time to transfer reinforcements to the 4th Tank Army had no success. The request to transfer 3 TK from Army Group A to us was rejected by OK. 7 TD, which the Army Group Command was intended to transfer to the 4th Panzer Army, Hitler decided to keep near Rostov to cover from the north the crossing of the Don, after the disaster of the Italian Army. In general, this was the right idea, but to accomplish this task would be enough infantry division, which was requested by us from Army Group A. Hitler rejected our request, because he feared that after the removal of this division from the defence near Novorossiysk remained there, Romanian divisions will not withstand the onslaught of the enemy. When a significant part of the enemy forces pursuing the 4th Tank Army turned south towards the retreating 1st Tank Army, the latter was in acute danger from the rear. 16 MD managed to successfully attack these enemy forces and block his way, taking the defence behind Menik. But because of this, it could not be used by the 4th Tank Army, as it could not be transferred to this army until mid-January. Measures to strengthen the 4th Tank Army, which we were going to take by our own forces, were thwarted by the enemy. 11 TD had to be withdrawn from the area of the Don Bend and through the lower course of the Don to transfer to the 4th Tank Army. But at this time the enemy in two places forced the Don and intended to strike from the south or southeast in the rear of the group meter, which occupied the defence on the lower Chiru front to the north. In order to stop the enemy and ensure the group meter withdrawal and occupation of the Kagalnik River front line to the east, had to enter the Battle 11 TD on the north bank of the Don. Its transfer to the 4th Tank Army therefore became impossible. Thus, in addition to the two above-mentioned tank divisions, the 57th TK included only the SS Division Viking already previously transferred to us by the Group A. The enemy pursued the 4th Tank Army through Kotelnikovo 2 Armies 51 and two guards, which in total had one tank, three mechanized, three rifle and one cavalry corps. Another army soon appeared further south in the Karmic steppes. It was easy to see that these three armies, the enemy intended not only to shackle or crush the weak four panzer army frontal attack, but also at the same time to cover it from the north and south, with the aim of subsequent encirclement. If Hitler thought that with the given balance of forces and the great width of the defended strip, he could order the army to hold some lines and forbid to withdraw without his consent, he was deeply mistaken. An attempt in this situation to force the army to solve its task, tying it to a certain boundary, would be tantamount to an attempt to delay the enemy with an obstacle from a spider's web. But since Hitler was constantly trying to limit the operational mobility of the army, ordering it to hold this or that boundary, and at the same time denied us the required reinforcements for the 4th Panzer Army, I was forced on January 5th, but I was forced to raise the question of my release from the duties of the commander of the army group. I sent a telegram to the chief of the general staff, which read if these proposals are not accepted, and I will continue to be restricted in my actions to the smallest detail, that I see no point in my continued use as commander. In this case it is more appropriate to organise representative offices such as those established in the office of the quartermaster general. In this state of affairs, the 4th Tank Army should have sought to concentrate its forces into a fist, instead of making a futile attempt to resist the enemy on an overly stretched front. Only as a result of this could she, depending on the situation, offer strong resistance to the enemy in a decisive area or strike him by surprise wherever it proved possible. Of course, for this purpose it would have to completely denude some parts of its allotted strip, and in other parts it would have to be content with creating a line of protection. 
With calm, flexible and decisive action, Colonel General Goff, with the help of his excellent Chief of Staff General Fangor, was able to solve this difficult problem. He was able to successfully delay the advance of the enemy, chasing him on the heels of the front, and at the same time avoided defeat, which would have threatened him if he lingered too long in the defences. By inflicting short blows quickly concentrated on both flanks of the forces, he thwarted the enemy's attempts to cover the flanks of the army. The Army Group Command, which could not provide the army with sufficient forces to accomplish this difficult task, tried to at least relieve the responsibility of the army command with its orders. As stated above, the 4th Tank Army had, in fact, to accomplish two tasks simultaneously. It had to prevent the three pursuing enemy armies to hit the rear of the 1st Tank Army, withdrawing from the Caucasus, before the latter completed its manoeuvre and took the defence front to the east. At the same time, it was to prevent the enemy's attempt to break through along the lower reaches of the Don River to Rostov. In case of success of this attempt would have been cut off our three armies, which were still south of the Don. Four tank army at best was able to solve only one of these problems, which of them should be given preference, could only decide the command of the army group, its decision to take responsibility for the consequences. Army group command decided to give preference to the task of covering the withdrawal manoeuvre of the first tank army. True, in the long run near Rostov threatened great danger. But if the enemy had managed to get into the rear of the retreating army and surround it, our retention of Rostov would not have changed anything. The fate of the three German armies south of the Lower Don would have been decided. However, provided the successful implementation of the withdrawal of the first tank army, we would subsequently find the means and way to cope with the critical situation at Rostov. The enemy did try to use both of these opportunities. We have already mentioned that he very early sent his forces to the rear of the 1st Tank Army, but they were timely stopped 16 MD on the Upper Menik. The same operational goal was pursued by repeated attempts of the enemy to bypass the 4th Tank Army from the south and wedge between it and the 1st Tank Army. At the same time he tried to break through one tank corps, along the Don through Konstantinovskaya in the direction of Rostov. On January 7th, Small enemy forces appeared on the northern bank of the Don, about 20 km from Novocherkask, where the headquarters of the army group was located. Cossacks and border guard units, which had been guarding this section of the river, retreated in front of the enemy. To drive away these violators of our peace, we sent against them several tanks, which were under repair, under the command of an officer of our operational department, Captain Annis. Further, this tank corps of the enemy turned to the southeast to the rear of the 4th Tank Army in the direction of Proletarskaya, which, at least for a while, the threat to Rostov was eliminated. 4 Panzer Army then managed to deal with this threat on its northern flank as well. On January 14th, one tank army completed its withdrawal, the pace of which it nevertheless accelerated. Its left wing was turned to the east and occupied the line Cherkesk petrovskoy Thus, to some extent, the possibility of operational interaction between the 1st and 4th tank armies was ensured, although there was still a wide gap between them from Petroskoye to Proletarskaya. Partially this gap was covered by the swampy Menich depression. The first part of the task of the 4th tank army to cover the rear of Army Group A in the area south of Rostov was thus accomplished. Now it still had a second task to protect the communications of this group in the area of Rostov, the fulfilment of this task in conditions of large numerical superiority of the enemy was complicated by the fact that the first tank army had to stay for some time on the line occupied by it to prepare further evacuation of their rear. It seemed that the task of the 4th Panzer Army will be completely impossible as Hitler still could not bring himself to part with the entire Caucasus territory. It had not yet been decided whether the 1st Panzer Army would be withdrawn via Rostov to the north bank of the Don, or whether it would remain in the Kuban together with the whole of Group A. While the 4th Tank Army in the first half of January solved its task south of the Don River, the Group Hollett faced an equally difficult task in the area of the Big Bend of the Don. As already mentioned in the chapter The Stalingrad Tragedy, during the past weeks, the enemy's significantly superior forces repeatedly attacked the front of Golit's group on the Cher River. General Golit had at his disposal including his subordinate battle group meter, four infantry divisions, badly damaged in previous battles. The front of the army group stretched about 200 kilometers from Nizhny Cherskaya, 
on the Don to Kamensk-Shaktinsky. In addition, on this front, there were groups hastily formed from vacationers, logistics workers, ETT, and anti-aircraft artillery units under the command of the proven General Stagel. Anti-aircraft artillery was a valuable means of reinforcement for this front. The two airfield divisions, also part of the Golit group, were completely defeated and their remnants could only be incorporated into the infantry divisions. The main striking force of the group was 6 and 11 TD, joined by the newly arrived 7 TD, while the defeated 22 TD had to be disbanded. With the help of these forces, General Golit had to solve the following problem until then to delay the enemy's advance from the north in the direction to the lower reaches of the Dom, that is, in the rear of the 4th Tank Army, and prevent his breakthrough to Rostov. While the 4th Tank Army and Grupa were still in the area south of the lower reaches of the Don. In addition, Golit's group had to prevent the enemy, facing its left flank, to break through to the crossings across the Donets near Belaya Kalitva and Voroshilovgrad, which would open the way to Rostov from the northwest. At the same time, the group was threatened from both flanks. On the western flank, this danger was caused by the defeat of the Italians, in place of which now General Freta Pico's group was slowly withdrawing from the area of Milarovo to the Donets. On the eastern flank this danger was caused by the fact that several enemy corps forced the Don first at Potemkinskaya and then at Simlinskaya. Reflect this danger Golit's group could only with the help of the actions of 11 TD, described above, and the withdrawal of Mita's group behind the river Kagalnik front to the east. Like the 4th Tank Army, Golit's group managed to cope with its task in heavy fighting and in the conditions of ever-new crises thanks to firm and at the same time flexible management of troops. But even here the army group command was forced in some cases to take responsibility for the actions of the Golit group, ordering it to concentrate its tank forces for short counterattacks, although this was associated with great risk. If Golit's group, after fighting with varying success, still managed to stop the enemy on the Don, and prevent him from cutting off the 4th Tank Army and Group A in the area south of the Don, it was achieved mainly as a result of the bravery with which the infantry divisions and the rest of the defending troops repelled the continuous attacks of the enemy. But these defensive battles would never have succeeded if our tank divisions had not always appeared in a timely manner in decisive areas. So it was when they eliminated the threat of coverage of the right flank of the group, and ensured the possibility of its withdrawal to the River Kagelnik front to the east and subsequently repelled enemy attacks in this area, threatening a breakthrough. This was the case when on the north-facing front of the group the tank divisions suddenly attacked the enemy, who was preparing for an offensive behind the Donets, and thus prevented a possible crisis. Conducting such counter-attacks as part of the defensive action was within the competence of the command of the Hollit group, but the responsibility for the risk involved still lay usually on us. The army group command had to relieve Gollet of responsibility for complications that might arise from the fact that for such counter-attacks on our orders concentrated large forces of tanks, which inevitably created a threat to the rest of the front. Operational situation in mid-January 1943. By the middle of January 1944, the operational situation on the southern flank of the eastern front which had begun to develop in the late fall of 1942, after the German command had frozen the front on such a line, the holding of which for a long period of time was operationally impossible, was finally clarified. What could clearly be foreseen already in the Christmas days of 1942, when the last possibility of a breakthrough of the Sixth Army was not realised, now really came. Only the desperate efforts of the German command and German troops avoided the worst. The 6th Army was heading towards its doom. At best it could still from the last forces to restrain large enemy forces, and thus fulfil to the end of the highest duty of loyalty to their comrades fighting in the Don steppes and in the Caucasus. It was clear that after the death of the 6th Army under no circumstances it would not be possible to hold at least a part of the Caucasian territory. But still, thanks to the persistent manoeuvring battles of the 4th Tank Army in the area south of the Don River, there was still hope that, having lost the Caucasus, we would not have to lose Army Group A as well. We managed to pull back the most threatened eastern flank of this group. Although the L-Tank Army was still 300 kilometres from the crossing of the Don at Rostov, it was no longer threatened from the rear, after it left the mountains. 
it was now able to secure its own further withdrawal if necessary. In the area between the Don and the Donets had so far succeeded in blocking the enemy's way to Rostov and preventing him from cutting off from the north the three armies south of the Lower Don. But it was clear that neither Task Force Gullet nor fighting at Milorovo Group Freta Pico will not be able to prevent the enemy to force the Donets above Kamensk Shokinsky, as soon as he accumulated sufficient forces to penetrate so far to the west. But then the way from the northwest to Rostov or to the coast of the Sea of Azov would open before him. Just in these days, a section of the front of Army Group B, on the Don, which was defended by the Hungarian army, was broken through. In this catastrophe also suffered a neighbouring section of the front of Army Group further north. Army Group B intended to withdraw its forces behind Adar that is approximately to the line of Starobelsk. Thus it opened for the enemy the Donitz below Voroshilovgrad. Practically this wing of the army group in a few days no longer existed. From Voroshilovgrad to the north formed a wide gap. Here in some points put up desperate resistance disparate battle groups of German troops from the composition of Group B, while the Hungarians, like the Italians, disappeared from the battlefield. Oak clearly could not count on the fact that this gap could be closed with the help of the reserves sent here. Army Group Don commanders well understood that now was the moment for the transfer of large forces from the area south of the Don to the middle course of the Donitz, as it was the only way to prevent the encirclement of Army Groups Don and A. However, the German High Command did not share this view. Either it was unable to understand how events would unfold if no decisive action was taken to concentrate sufficient forces in the decisive area between the Donitz and the Lower Dnieper, or it did not want to realise the danger of the situation. Hitler still did not want to finally give up the Caucasus. He still thought that it would be possible to somehow create and hold a front south of the Don, which would allow him to retain at least the Mykop oil region. As a last resort, he intended to hold a large bridgehead on the Kuban, from which he hoped in due course to relaunch the offensive to seize Caucasian oil. So, in the coming weeks... The command of Army Group Don was again forced to fight desperate battles on both banks of the Don in the interests of a systematic withdrawal of Army Group A. At the same time, it had to fight hard with the German High Command, defending its plan to transfer forces along the Rockades to the Donetsk region. In this struggle, it was not only about the acceptance of the very idea of such a movement of forces, but also about how many troops from the composition of the group I should withdraw through Rostov to the decisive operational direction. In our opinion, to leave large forces of Army Group A on the Kuban bridgehead meant to indulge in such dreams, which can never be realised in reality. On January 14th, when the 1st Tank Army finished the withdrawal to the line Cherkesk petrovskoy and took the defence front to the east, in the band of the group Hollit outlined a new aggravation of the situation. On the right flank of Army Group B, on the site of General Freta Pico south of Milorovo, one tank corps of the enemy managed to break through in the direction of Donets. Okave, however, this group a new 302 PDN. But its forces were completely insufficient to restore the situation on the Donets. When on January 16th the OK transferred the Freta Pico group to our subordination, it was not even sure that it would be able to move beyond the Donets. By that time the enemy's intention to make a breakthrough in the band of this group to the Donets above and below Kamensk Shaktinsky by forces of three or four tank or mechanised corps had become clear. Fortunately, a few days before this group Golit achieved great success, a sudden blow of two armoured divisions on its left flank on the Kalitva River, it thwarted the enemy offensive that was being prepared here. Therefore, the Army Group Command ordered the Golit Group to carry out its withdrawal to the Donets in such a way that in the shortest possible time released one armoured division to conduct manoeuvre defence on the section of the Donets River between Fort Start and Kamenskoye. We had no troops at our disposal to fight on the new for us section of the front along the Donets River from Kamensk to Voroshilovgrad, except for the remnants of the Italian army that had withdrawn here. It was impossible not to see that the Donetsk front of Army Group Don could very soon be bypassed by the enemy from the west. At the same time, however, outlined the enemy's intention to cover the group Gollet also from the east. In the triangle between the rivers Sal, Don and Menik intelligence found two corps for the enemy. They wedged into the gap between the right flank of Gollet's group at the confluence of the Donets into the Don, 
and the left flank of the 4th Tank Army, which was still fighting with superior enemy forces on the Menik beyond Salsk, covering the northern wing of the 1st Tank Army. It could be expected that this group of the enemy would try to force the Don in order to move on to Rostov or to hit in the rear of the troops of the group Golit, occupying the defence on the Donets. Therefore, the army group command demanded that he was finally allowed to move the 4th Panzer Army on its western flank. Naturally, giving us such permission, Oak had to simultaneously give army group a order to withdraw the 1st Panzer Army to Rostov and the 17th Army to the Kuban. But even this time from Hitler could not get a quick decision. Hitler also did not accept the proposal of the command of Army Group Don on the concentration of tank divisions of Army Group A. In the band of the 4th Panzer Army, in order to short counterattack to defuse the situation in the area south of the Don and thus provide an opportunity to withdraw the 1st Panzer Army, as well as accelerate the release of the 4th Panzer Army. Only on January 18th, OK finally agrees to give the 4th Tank Army freedom of manoeuvre because it is no longer required that it covers the northern flank of the 1st Tank Army on the Menik northeast of Salsk. Instead, Group Don is assigned the task of ensuring that the rostov tikaretskaya railway line can be used for the transportation of Army Group until 8080 echelons with supplies for the troops, leaving on the Kuban bridgehead have passed through it. The question of whether the 1st Tank Army would be withdrawn to Rostov or to the Cuban was still open. The decision on the transfer of forces within the southern wing of the front from east to west all delayed, which of course was only in the hands of the enemy. The enemy won time, during which he could use the defeat of the Italian and Hungarian armies on the front of the Group B, and concentrate large forces for the offensive through the middle course of the Donitz, towards the coast of the Sea of Azov and the crossings of the Dnieper. These forces of the enemy German command at that time could not oppose anything. At the same time, the enemy had the opportunity to concentrate his troops for a direct attack on Rostov and to cover the western flank of Golitz group from Voroshilovgrad. On January 20th, the enemy launched an offensive with the forces of four corps corps, concentrated for this purpose on the front of the 4th Tank Army south of the Don, through the lower reaches of the Menik River, to Rostov. His tanks reached the Rostov airfield, transferred by the command of the 4th Tank Army here to the northern flank of the 16MD, which had previously from the southern bank of the Menik strikes in the flank of the enemy advancing between the Menik and the Don, and thereby forcing him to slow down the pace of advance, of course, could not alone stop the advance of these four corps of the enemy. Attacking at the same time 57TK of the same army, which was retreating with battles from line to line from the middle Menik to Rostov, the enemy sought to restrain the main forces of the army in front of Rostov until it takes possession of the crossing of the Don in Rostov in the rear. Further, the enemy also attacked Golit's group with large forces, apparently also aiming to bind our forces until he could encircle them by taking Rostov and covering them from the middle Donis. By these attacks, undertaken both against Mitz Korp in the corner between the Don and the Don and the Donents, and on both sides of Kamensk, the enemy was probably at the same time endeavouring to prevent us from throwing against him on the middle Donates the forces which we could here unleash. Once again, the army group command faced the question of which of the two threats should have been addressed first. In the band of the group Hollet two armoured divisions stood ready to move to the western flank, the middle course of the Donates. No matter how great the danger that threatened us in the near future, the army group command considered it a priority task to eliminate the threat at Rostov. It was necessary to do everything to ensure the withdrawal through Rostov, not only the 4th Panzer Army, but also at least the entire 1st Panzer Army. Otherwise, there was no way to count on the fact that on the western flank we'll ever be able to concentrate sufficient forces to prevent the encirclement of the entire southern wing of the eastern front, near the sea coast. Therefore, the Army Group Command decided to use 1st 7 and 11 TD to launch a counterattack on the enemy advancing through the Lower Menich to Rostov, to prevent him from cutting off our troops at Rostov. However, due to the lack of fuel, and because of the fact that the bad weather did not give the aircraft the opportunity to support these actions, counterattack did not yield positive results in the time required under the circumstances. And time was not waiting. Since the resistance of the 6th Army was coming to an end, we had to expect that in two to three weeks on our head will fall most of the enemy forces, which were still constrained at Stalingrad. As early as January 22nd, 
I informed General Zeitzler that I expect the appearance of these forces in the area of Starobelsk, that is, in a wide gap between army groups Don and B. On this day, Hitler finally decided to withdraw at least part of the forces of the 1st Panzer Army not on the Cuban bridgehead, but through Rostov, that is, to transfer them to the operational direction, which in the future was to become decisive. Although it was a half-hearted decision, it was to be welcomed as going towards the operational plan of the command of Army Group Don. All that remained was to realise this withdrawal as soon as possible, so that the 4th Tank Army could be moved as soon as possible to the western flank of Army Group. In order that the 1st Panzer Army could be quickly enough withdrawn back through Rostov, it was necessary that the entire Group A as a whole to coordinate with its withdrawal of the pace of its movements. But apparently Group A even now could not yet accelerate these rates to the necessary extent. I have not been able to fully find out the reason for this. In any case, the command of the 1st Tank Army argued later, when the army had already come under my command, that it could from the beginning to make the withdrawal at a faster pace. But it kept being delayed by instructions from above. Both the command of Army Group A and the Oak denied this. In any case, the command of Army Group A intended to so organise the withdrawal of its left flank, which on January 23rd was still at Belea Glina, 50 km east of Tikaritskaya, that it would approach Tikaritskaya only on February 1st. On January 23rd, Army Group Don again received the inheritance. This time we were given the southern section of the front of Group B between Donitz and Starobelsk. As usually happens, in this inheritance there were much more liabilities than assets. These liabilities consisted in the lengthening of our front by almost 100 kilometres, as well as in opposing us three corps of the enemy corps advancing in this area. The only asset was the 19 TD located at Starobelsk as the Italians were no longer to be counted on. But already on January 24th the division was forced to leave Starobelsk. A special merit of this brave division, whose actions were perfectly led by its commander, Lieutenant General Postel, was that it managed to get through to the west. But it could not prevent the superior enemy forces to turn south across the Donets. On January 24th, Hitler decided that now the entire 1st Panzer Army, if possible, was withdrawn through Rostov. Its southern flank was by this time still at Armavir, which meant, of course, that the 4th Panzer Army will have to stay south of the Don for some time to ensure that it can withdraw through Rostov. It was becoming increasingly doubtful whether after this will still be able to timely transfer the 4th Panzer Army to the western flank of the group. Nevertheless, two circumstances pleased us. Army Group A, which for obvious reasons very reluctantly agreed that one of its armies went beyond the Don finally realised that its fate will be decided on the Donets, not on the Kuban. In addition, it was becoming increasingly doubtful whether it would be possible to supply everything necessary to the very large forces in the Kuban bridgehead across the Kerch Strait. Now, the command of Group A also began to advocate that the largest possible forces were withdrawn through Rostov. The second circumstance was that the above-mentioned counterattack of two tank divisions on the enemy advancing on the Lower Menik on January 25th finally gave the desired success. This for some time was eliminated the immediate threat to the Rostov crossing. However, the situation on the southern flank of the 4th Tank Army was again becoming critical. The enemy pulled here new forces taken, apparently, from the pursuing group of formations. He tried to wedge between the 4th Panzer Army and the northern flank of the 1st Panzer Army to cover the 4th Panzer Army from the south and push the 1st Panzer Army away from Rostov. The command of Army Group Don categorically demanded from the command of Group A that it allocate one division to participate in these battles and in every possible way accelerate the withdrawal of the 1st Tank Army to Rostov. On January 27th, Group Don was finally subordinated to at least half of the 1st Panzer Army, located to the north, so that we could now demand the necessary measures in the order. At the same time, the Army Group Command decided to move to the Middle Donitz, first the headquarters of the 1st Tank Army, which was released from the area south of the Don earlier than the 4th Tank Army, which was still to cover the Rostov crossing of the Don. The Army headquarters were to be followed by divisions of this army passing through Rostov, and then the released units of the 4th Tank Army. January 31st, finally, there was hope that the 1st Tank Army will be able to withdraw through Rostov but there was still an open question whether it will be able to be in time on the Domitz to prevent the enemy breakthrough 
through the Domitz to the sea coast. Unfortunately, in this direction, which in the future was to become decisive, could not transfer all the compounds of the first tank army, in view of the fact that Hitler hesitated for a long time and could not decide whether to withdraw the army to Rostov or to the Kuban, 50 PD could not already at Armavir to join the troops withdrawing to Rostov and was transferred to the 17 army. At the last moment, after much hesitation, Hitler decided also to return to the Cuban again in the group of 13 TD, for which we had until recently kept open the passage to Rostov. Thus these two divisions could not be used in the battles in the decisive area. At the same time, about 400,000 people on the Cuban bridgehead were more or less removed from active combat operations. They, however, restrained large enemy forces. The enemy unsuccessfully tried to eliminate this bridgehead. However, to the operational use of this bridgehead, which Hitler had hoped, it did not come to the point. The enemy could still decide at his discretion how many troops to keep in front of this bridgehead. Hitler justified the need to leave such a large force on this bridgehead by the fact that it was impossible to give the enemy naval port of Novorossiysk. But even this argument was untenable, because Novorossiysk had to be left anyway. January 29th Army Group Headquarters from Taganrog, where he withdrew on January 12th, moved to Stalin, because now the decisive direction of the group was no longer on the Don, but on the Donets. While still south of the Don and in a large bend of the Don were fighting, aimed at covering the withdrawal of the group A from the Caucasus, and ultimately decide the fate of the entire southern wing of the German army, in the foreground was a new problem. It was whether this southern wing would be able to hold the Donbass. Already in 1941, the Donbass played a significant role in Hitler's operational plans. He believed that the outcome of the war would depend on the mastery of this territory, located between the Sea of Azov, the lower reaches of the Don and the lower and middle reaches of the Donets, and extending in the west to approximately the line mariupol krasnomyskoye Izium. On the one hand, Hitler argued that without the coal reserves of this area we could not sustain the war economically. On the other hand, in his opinion, the loss of this coal by the Soviets would be a decisive blow to their strategy. Donetsk coal, Hitler believed, was the only coking coal. The loss of this coal would sooner or later paralyze the production of tanks and ammunition in the Soviet Union. I do not wish to go into the consideration of the extent to which this opinion of Hitler was justified. But it is indisputable that the Soviets were producing thousands of tanks and millions of shells in 1942 to 1943 without Donetsk coal. The question was, however, whether we had enough forces to hold the Donbass. There was no doubt that from the military and economic point of view it was desirable to hold Donbass. It must be said, however, that although we used considerable quantities of Donetsk coal for ourselves, all the coal needed for the railroad serving the area had to be imported from Germany, since Donetsk coal was not suitable for our steam locomotives. Thus, the capacity of the railroads for military transportation was greatly reduced, since the railroad had to transport several echelons of coal daily for its own consumption. Be that as it may, Hitler stood on the point of view that he could by no means do without the Donbass in military and economic terms. However, the possibility of holding the Donbass became doubtful from the moment when the front of the Hungarian army south of Voronezh was defeated and the enemy thus opened the way to the Donitz and further to the crossings of the Dnieper and the coast of the Sea of Azov. For the first time, the question of holding the Donbass was raised on January 19th in a telephone conversation between me and General Zeitzler. He wanted to hear my opinion on this question, which he had tried the previous day to put before Hitler, though without any success. On that day, there was a threat of a gap forming in the front from Voroshilovgrad to Voronezh. I told him that this question is not difficult to answer, no matter how great the economic importance of this area. In order to hold this area in its entirety, it is necessary to concentrate large forces as soon as possible and as far east as possible, if possible still ahead of Kharkov. If this proves impossible because of the fact that it is impossible to remove troops from the fronts of Group North and Group Centre, or because of the fact that the formation of new units in the rear has not yet been completed, or because the OKW will not provide forces from other theatres, or finally, because of the fact that the railroad cannot provide such a concentration in a short time, then nothing remains but to draw the necessary conclusions from all this. The southern wing of the German army, 
will not be able to close this gap with its own forces, remaining at the same time on the lower Don. Nor will the South Wing be able to continue its fighting here, in complete isolation, if the expected new forces will enter the battle only after a long time and far behind, that is, out of any operational connection with the actions of the South Wing. The fighting of the Southern Wing and the concentration of new forces must be coordinated territorially in such a way that an operational link is established between them. Either it is necessary to concentrate the new forces in a short time and relatively far to the east, then the Don group will be able to remain on the lower Don and Donitz, or this will not be possible, and then the Don group must be pulled back as far as necessary for the deployment of these new forces. Otherwise, the enemy will have the opportunity to cut off the entire southern wing of the German army before the reinforcements that would have arrived. In any case, there was no doubt that the forces concentrated by mid-February at Kharkov SS Panzer Corps will not be enough to close the gap in the front from Voroshilovgrad to Voronezh. Nor could it be used in time for a counterattack north of the Donitz to eliminate the threat on the flank of the southern wing, if the latter remained on the Don and Donets. The following days confirmed the fears that the command of the army group had about the development of the situation in the depths of its flank. Already on January 20th, the intention of two enemy corps to bypass the left flank of the army group, the connection of General Freta Pico, standing near Kamenskoye in the direction of Voroshilovgrad was already indicated. The enemy was also probing the defence of the remnants of the Italian army, passing behind the Don east of Voroshilovgrad. In general, the main forces of the enemy, apparently, sought to move westward in the direction of Starobelsk, obviously, the enemy wanted first of all to reach the operational space. We could expect that in case of success of this manoeuvre, the enemy would not limit himself only to the coverage of the Freta Pico group, that, but would move further westward with large forces and would advance across the Donets in the direction of the Dnieper crossings, or on the coast of the Sea of Azov. On January 24th, there was already a report of the appearance of enemy cavalry on the south bank of the Donitz near Voroshilovgrad, although it may have appeared to some local commandant's office out of fear. On January 31st, I sent a telegram to the OK, in which I once again stated my point of view on the question of the possibility of holding Donbass. The main prerequisite for this I considered a timely strike from Kharkov and defeat the enemy northeast of Kharkov before the beginning of the thaw. If this, as unfortunately, was to be expected, would be impossible, the Donetsk Basin, or, in any case, its entire eastern part, could not be held. It would therefore be an operational mistake to try to hold on to the Donets and the Lower Don. In addition, it should be taken into account that our available forces are not enough to hold the entire Donbass, if the enemy will pull up here new large forces from under Stalingrad or from the Caucasus, and he will certainly do it. It was impossible to rely only on the fact that the enemy's forces will be depleted or that difficulties with supplies will immediately disrupt his operations. With these arguments, Hitler usually objected to General Zeitzler when he pointed out to him the overwhelming numerical superiority of the enemy based on the available to us basically correct intelligence data. These arguments were also to some extent justified, but it should have been borne in mind that the enemy's battles with the Allied forces cost him very few losses and that in the organisation of the supply of troops he had much more freedom than we. Already in the next few days our predictions about the enemy's actions were confirmed. His intention to squeeze and at the same time bypass our northern front on the Donets became clear. On February 2nd, the enemy forced the Donets east of Voroshilovgrad, the Italians standing there did not offer serious resistance. The enemy concentrated in this area a strike group of three tank, one mechanised and one rifle corps, apparently from among the troops that defeated the Italian front on the Don. It could be assumed that the purpose of this strike group was the capture of Rostov, or Taganrog. Having knocked out the 19th TD from Starobelsk, the enemy sent another large group, consisting of three or four four tank corps and one rifle corps to the southwest to the slaviansk lysychansk line. Obviously, he planned to cover our flank, striking far to the west, in the area near Voroshilovgrad or east of it, not taking into account the areas occupied by the defeated Italian units. The days since the end of January, if we do not count the activities undertaken by the army group in its strip, which were aimed at the rapid transfer of the first tank army to the middle Donets, 
were filled with a dispute between the army group and the OK about the further conduct of operations in general. As I have already mentioned, as early as January 19th, I reported to General Zeitzler that the entire Donbass could be held only by an effective, rapid offensive of large forces from Kharkov. But since we could not wait for agreement on this plan, I asked to reduce the depth of echelonization of our eastern flank, at least to free up the necessary forces to act in conjunction with the proposed reinforcements to prevent the cutting off of the southern flank. We had moved one tank army to the middle Donets to prevent the already threatening coverage of Holid's group. Now, it was necessary to do so, to take out of the balcony and the fourth tank army located on the lower Don and Donets. Only in this way it was possible to prevent in time the danger, which threatened in the future that the enemy, advancing on the Isium slaviansk line, would try to cut us off from crossing the Dnieper. We had to constantly reckon with the fact that the enemy would bring new forces, besides those that were already at Slaviansk, in the direction up the Donitz River, and further to the lower Dnieper. Except for one division of the SS Panzer Corps, which arrived at this time in the area of Kharkov, in the section of Army Group B, opposed the enemy only remnants of units. They could not prevent the enemy to turn and move further into our deep flank. Four tank army could be released only by significantly reducing the front line of Army Group. Instead of continuing to hold the large arc formed by the Lower Don and Donates from Rostov to the area west of Voroshilovgrad, it was necessary to move the right flank of the group on the cord of this arc. This was the position that the southern flank of the Germans held in 1941, after the first retreat from Rostov, a position from the Mias boundary further north to the Middle Donets. The reduction of the front to this line of positions, which though destroyed since then, still gave us a known foothold, meant of course the abandonment of the eastern part of the Donetsk coal district. In order to justify this withdrawal, I tried to support my reasoning in reporting to the general command by reference to the direction of military operations, with further prospects in mind. In one telegram, sent by me personally to Hitler, I wrote the following. The retention of the Don Donates arc in the future by the troops available to the army group is impossible, even if we adhere only to defensive actions. In case the German high command in connection with the loss of the 6th Army with its 20 divisions in 1944 will be forced to limit itself to defence. The attempt to defend the entire Donbass at any cost will lead to the restraining of all available units for the defence of this protruding front. But as a result of this, the enemy will have a free hand and will be able to attack on any section of the entire Eastern Front with vastly superior forces. If now Army Group Don was threatened with encirclement on the Sea of Azov, then later even if it could be avoided and hold the entire Donbass. The enemy would set himself the goal of encircling the entire southern wing of the Eastern Front at the Black Sea. If, however, the High Command intends to seek offensive success once more in 1944, it is again possible only on the southern wing of the Eastern Front. But this cannot be done from the Don Donates Arc area because of the known difficulties of supply as well as the threat to the flanks, to which any offensive from this protruding balcony was exposed in advance. The success of the offensive, if it could be thought of at all, could be achieved if it was possible to lead the enemy on the southern flank westward, beyond the lower reaches of the Dnieper. Then it was possible to advance from the Kharkov area large forces that could break the Russian at the junction between their fronts to then turn south and encircle the enemy near the Sea of Azov. Hitler, however, was not, it seemed, inclined to agree with these thoughts. As the chief of the general staff informed me, he himself told Hitler that it was a matter of whether to give the Donbass or lose it along with Army Group Don. To this Hitler replied that he was apparently right from an operational point of view. For military and economic reasons, however, the abandonment of the Donbass is impossible. It is important not so much from the point of view of the loss of coal for us, but because the enemy in this case will again get the most important coal basin necessary for the production of steel. As a way out of the situation Hitler envisioned a breakthrough by the forces of the first of the three divisions of the SS Panzer Corps, Division Reich, which arrived just in the area of Kharkov, in the direction from Kharkov to the rear of the enemy troops advancing on our Donetsk front. Not to mention the fact that the forces of this division were completely insufficient for such a large operation, and that it was not able to cover the increasingly stretched northern flank, the, 
The introduction of this one division into the battle would have obviously meant the dispersal of the only expected in the near future strike force, the SS Panzer Corps. However, even this division in reality was not for the planned offensive operation. Due to the rapid advance of the Soviets in the direction of Kharkov, the command of Army Group B was forced to throw this division into the battle. It was tied up at this time completely unpromising defensive fighting northeast of Kharkov near Volchansk. In the following days, the situation at the front of Army Group Don noticeably worsened. The enemy strongly pressed the 4th Tank Army, which was covering the withdrawal of the 1st Tank Army through Rostov, two armies of the former Caucasus front of the enemy, 44 and 58, joined the three armies that were operating against the 4th Tank Army. The danger posed to the enemy by the abandonment of Army Group together with the 17th Army on the flank of the Russians on the Kuban was not sufficient to prevent the enemy from turning significant forces in the direction of the decisive section. Group Command had to reckon with the fact that the enemy would soon conduct an offensive of large forces on Rostov as well as on the Don Front on both sides of Novocherkask. Further, it became known about the movement of a large motorised compound from Stalingrad in the direction of the Don, and on the left flank of the group the situation became much more acute. East of Voroshilovgrad 6 TD, thrown to the middle Donitz from the group of Golit by order of the group command, failed to repulse the enemy behind the Donitz. It was only able to restrain the enemy on his bridgehead. Further to the west the enemy was able to cross the Donitz on a wide front, as there were practically no forces to organise the defence. The enemy was located in front of Slavyansk and took possession of Izium. It had already become problematic whether it was possible to withdraw the Golit group to the Mias frontier at all. According to the plan of the command of the group, it was to go to the line Novocherkask Kamensk on January 5th. In fact, due to Hitler's refusal to approve the withdrawal of the front to the Mias line, it was still on the Don Donets line. If the enemy quickly attacked from Slaviansk to the southeast, he would have knocked us out of the position on the Mias. Although at this time the first tank army with its subordinate units, ordered by the group command, was moving from Rostov to the Middle Donets, it took several more days until this army could actually enter the battle. This happened because in the coastal area of the softened road significantly hampered the movement of armoured divisions, while further north the ground is frozen and did not limit, therefore, the possibility of movement of the Russians. In view of the threatening situation created, the group command not only renewed its demand for an immediate withdrawal of the right flank to the Mayas, but also put before the OK a number of other private demands, which were to show the danger of the situation. It demanded that the 7th Anti-Aircraft Division, which was used for air defence in the rear area and to protect the railroad leading through Demopetrovsky, as well as to repel attacks by ground units, be put into action. It required immediate preparations to supply the entire army group by air in case the enemy cut off its rear communications. It required a significant increase in the volume of rail transportation of military transports at the expense of supplying Army Group B, where there were hardly any units that needed to be supplied. It demanded that the SS Panzer Corps, as soon as it would be concentrated at Kharkov as a result of the accelerated rate of transfer, be sent to strike south of the Donitz to Izium in case the promised offensive of the Reich Division by February 6 did not succeed in helping us to reach Kupiansk. Finally, it required the immediate transfer of the combat troops of the 13th TD and two infantry divisions of the 17th Army to the Lower Dnieper, where they were to receive new weapons and supplies from the transports and columns of the 6th Army. If Hitler had already refused to listen to far-reaching operational plans, the situation surrounding these demands was at least to show him the gravity of the situation. The result of this telegram was that the Führer's Condor landed at our place on February 6th, which was to take me to his headquarters. Apparently it helped here visit in late January, his chief adjutant General Schmunt, to whom we very seriously stated our opinion about the situation at the front and the top military leadership, and Hitler decided to listen to me personally. The conversation on February 6th, 1944, between Hitler and me led to the fact that it was possible to prevent the threatening German southern flank disaster and give the high command a chance, at least, to achieve a draw of the war in the east. Hitler began our conversation, as I have already mentioned in the chapter on the Stalingrad tragedy, by unreservedly acknowledging his personal responsibility for the tragedy of the Sixth Army, which had ended a few days before. 
I had the impression at that time that he was not only severely affected by this tragedy, since it meant a clear failure of his leadership, but that he, as a man, was also very depressed by the fate of those soldiers who had fought bravely to the end and remained faithful to their duty, believing in him. Later, however, I had a strong doubt whether Hitler is touched by the fate of the soldiers who unaccountably trusted him and believed in him, whether he did not consider all of them from field marshal to the common soldier only as an instrument of his military policy. But whatever it was, but the fact that he fully recognised his responsibility for Stalingrad, from the soldier's point of view, was impressive. Intentionally or unconsciously, Hitler thereby psychologically skillfully began the conversation, which he generally knew how to do masterfully, adjusting to the tone of the interlocutor. As for me, I expected to discuss with him two issues. The first issue affected the further conduct of operations in my area, which depended on Hitler's consent to the abandonment of the eastern part of the Donbass, which I had to ask him by necessity. It was necessary to obtain this consent on the same day. The second question I wanted to raise concerned the highest military command, that is Hitler's leadership in the form in which it was exercised after Brauchicic's removal. The result of this leadership Stalingrad gave me sufficient reason. To answer the second question at once, I must say briefly that our conversation remained inconclusive. Realising that it was impossible for such a dictator as Hitler to give up the position of commander-in-chief, I tried to suggest to him a probable solution that would not affect his prestige, but in the future could ensure impeccable military leadership. I asked him to ensure the unity of military leadership by appointing one chief of the general staff, in whom he could fully trust and at the same time provide the appropriate powers and rights. Hitler, however, clearly did not want to discuss this issue on the merits. He kept switching to the question of personalities and complained of the disappointment he had experienced with former War Minister Blomberg and Field Marshal Brockage. He stated categorically that he could not give such rights to the Chief of the General Staff, as would practically place him over Goering. The latter would never submit to the direction that would come from the Chief of the General Staff, even if he were acting on Hitler's behalf. We will not now say whether Hitler was really afraid of such a decision to go against Goring or whether he was simply covering himself with this pretext. But above all, he kept coming back to the created operational situation. Since the situation required me to achieve a decision at all costs, and I had not yet received Hitler's consent to my operational plan, I had no choice but to reduce the entire conversation to operational matters. I had to obtain under all circumstances an immediate decision on this point. So I turn to the first question regarding the further conduct of operations in the area of Army Group Don. First I drew Hitler the actual situation in the area of operations of the group and made the resulting conclusions. I reported to him that our forces are not enough to hold the Ark Don Donitz. No matter how great for us, as well as for the enemy the importance of the Donitz Basin, the question is only whether we will lose the entire Donbass and his and Army Group Don, and therefore the Group Hay, or we timely abandoning part of this area will prevent the threatening disaster to us. In addition to the obvious issues of the situation, I tried to illuminate Hitler the prospects of the inevitable further development of events in the event that we remain on the balcony of the Arc Don Donitz. The enemy in this case will have the opportunity in connection with the almost complete disabling of the Group B, advancing in this area large forces to turn to the Lower Dnieper or the seacoast to cut off the entire southern flank. I explained to Hitler that on the southern flank could actually decide the fate of the Eastern Front. It could be confidently expected that the enemy will throw up from its strong reserves of new forces to realise the cut-off of the southern flank. Consequently, it could not be expected that the SS Panzer Corps will be enough to prevent counter-attack this inevitable deep bypass. The enemy has enough forces to carry out this manoeuvre of envelopment and at the same time to cover it from the Kharkov area in a westerly direction. All the forces that could be expected as German reinforcements would not have been sufficient to prevent this enemy strike. It was necessary, therefore, to send behind the first tank army, which was by this time on the march in the direction of the Middle Donitz, immediately the fourth tank army, so that it was able to disrupt by this time has not yet begun, but inevitably looming encompassing manoeuvre of the enemy between the Donitz and the Dnieper. Only then it will be possible to restore, in cooperation with suitable reinforcements, the position on the southern wing of the Eastern Front, that is, on the entire front between the coast of the Sea of Azov 
and the right flank of Army Group Centre. Without the withdrawal of the 4th Tank Army from the Lower Don, this would have been impossible. But its withdrawal from this area would mean the need to withdraw from the Don Donets Arc to a shorter cord on the Mayas. Not a single day was to be lost. Moreover, even now this event was in doubt, because it was unknown whether the Group Hollet, which was to defend now the entire front from the coast to the Middle Donets, as a result of the delay in time to reach the boundary of the Mayas. I had therefore on that day to obtain consent to abandon the eastern part of the Donbass up to the Mayas. After my report, which Hitler listened to quite calmly, an hour-long dispute broke out on the question of the Donitz Basin. During the second part of our conversation, when I spoke to Hitler one-on-one -on -one about general questions of leadership, he also kept returning to this problem. As I could later ascertain on other similar occasions, he avoided talking substantively about the operational questions I had put forward. He did not even attempt to put forward a different, better plan or to refute my operational arguments or conclusions. He did not dispute that the situation might unfold exactly as I had foreseen it. He regarded all matters that did not directly concern the acute military situation that had been created as hypotheses that might or might not materialise. In fact, in the end, all operational considerations are based, especially when the strategic initiative is not in our hands but in the hands of the enemy, on assumptions and hypotheses about what the enemy's actions are likely to be. It cannot be proved in advance that events will unfold this way or that way, but only that commander can count on success who is able to foresee. He should at least try to penetrate the veil that hides the future actions of the enemy and correctly assess the opportunities open to their own actions and the actions of the enemy. The larger the scale of leadership, the farther one must naturally look ahead. The larger the occupied area, the larger the formations that must be moved, the more time is required to implement the decision. Hitler did not have the ability to foresee far ahead, at least in the operational field. He may have been unwilling to recognise results if they did not conform to his wishes, but since he could not refute them, he circumvented them whenever possible. So it was in this case. He took his arguments predominantly from other fields. At first, of course, he expressed his negative attitude towards voluntarily giving up the areas we had conquered at great sacrifice, because, as he believed, there was no evidence yet that this voluntary relinquishment could not be avoided. To any soldier this argument is understandable. I just by my character was particularly difficult to prove to Hitler then, and many times later the necessity of abandoning the areas we had previously occupied. For me, of course, it would have been more pleasant to offer promising plans for an offensive instead of the inevitable retreat. But old experience teaches that if in war one wants to save everything, one will save nothing. Hitler's other argument, which he kept repeating to me, was that the reduction of the front which I proposed to free up forces would to the same extent free up the enemy's forces, which he would then throw on the scales in the decisive section. And that was certainly a valid argument, but in this case it is a matter of fact which of the two opponents in such movements of forces will be the first to use this factor, who therefore, by timely action will take the opportunity to take the initiative in the decisive section in his own hands, and will then as a result of this dictate to the late opponent his will, even if the opponent is generally stronger than him. Besides, in the case of an attempt to hold the Don Donate's arc, the too extended width of the front would eliminate the advantage that the defence has which requires less forces compared to the offensive. In this case, the offensive has the opportunity to break through the stretched front in any place with relatively small forces and without heavy losses. Since the defenders have no reserves, the enemy can completely defeat them. Further, Hitler kept emphasising that if you fight hard for every scrap of land and force the enemy to advance at the cost of heavy losses, then someday the offensive strength of even the Soviet army will run out. The enemy has already been on the offensive for two and a half months without interruption. He has very heavy losses, his offensive impulse will soon be exhausted. And the difficulties of supply at increasing distances from the starting points apparently will stop his planned deep bypass manoeuvre. Undoubtedly there was a lot of truth in all this. Undoubtedly the enemy, at least in his attack on the German-held areas, suffered heavy losses which greatly reduced its striking power the easier it was to get him victories in those parts of the front, where the German troops did not offer him stubborn resistance. It is also true that the combat effectiveness of Soviet troops 
especially infantry, significantly reduced due to the losses suffered. On the other hand, in view of the enemy's multiple superiority, we will not be able to hold at all. And if the enemy divisions due to losses partially lost their combat effectiveness, new divisions took their place. It is also true that as the area of operations of the Soviet army increased, it had more difficulties in organizing supplies. Still, the distances from the final railroad points of the enemy to the coast of the Sea of Azov or to the Lower Dnieper were not so great that they were able in the age of automobiles to disrupt the operation so dangerous for us to cut off the southern flank of the German army. Back in the First World War, there was a rule that the army cannot break away from their final railroad points for more than 150 km. That these data are inapplicable to the Second World War sufficiently proved our own operations in the West and East. In addition, the Russians were masters of quickly restoring roads, which was relatively easy to do with very few artificial structures on a vast plain. To base their actions, however, on the dubious hope that the enemy's forces were already running out or that he would no longer be able to advance was unacceptable. We must not, after all, forget that our divisions had been severely weakened in the long and intense fighting and were on the verge of exhaustion of their forces. I must say here that Hitler was well aware of the condition and the losses of our troops. But he very reluctantly agreed that the newly formed divisions have little combat experience and must first suffer heavy losses. However, he agreed that the formation of airfield divisions was a mistake, just as he agreed that their formation was a concession for the sake of preserving Goering's prestige. With regard to the operational situation, Hitler actually expressed only the opinion that the SS Panzer Corps could eliminate a serious danger to the front on the Middle Donitz by a strike from the Kharkov area to the southeast to Izium. The prerequisite for this should be, however, that before the arrival of the second division of this corps, the Leibstandarte division, the Reich division could finish off the enemy at Volchansk. His hope for the striking power of this newly formed SS Panzer Corps was apparently boundless. Otherwise, his considerations showed that he did not yet understand or did not want to understand the dangers looming in the future, namely the dangers associated with the appearance on the new battlefield of the enemy's Stalingrad formations. The most compelling reason, which all along Hitler emphasised, was, in his opinion, the impossibility of giving up Donbass. He feared the impact of the political consequences associated with the loss of this area, important in military and economic terms, on the position of Turkey, but above all, he emphasised the importance of Donetsk coal for his own military industry and the importance of the absence of this factor for the enemy's military economy. The possession of Donetsk coal would enable the Russians to maintain at the present level the production of tanks, guns and ammunition. My objection that the Soviets, despite the loss of Donbass, were still producing enough tanks and ammunition, he tried to refute by saying that they had previously possessed steel reserves. But if they didn't get Donetsk coal, they wouldn't be able to maintain their previous production, hence they wouldn't be able to mount much of an offensive. It could not be argued against the fact that in consequence of the enemy's loss of this deposit of coking coals, and of the steel and other factories located there, he was experiencing difficulties in war production. A sign of this, it seemed to me, was the fact that the enemy still could not compensate for the losses in artillery suffered by him in 1941. This allowed us in due time to organise the defence on a shoddily assembled broad front on the Chira. In that winter the enemy had enough guns to field a superior artillery force on a limited section of the front, as was the case in three successive breakthroughs on the Don front. But it was clearly insufficient to supply all divisions with motorised artillery. When discussing the military and economic importance of the Donbass, Hitler had the opportunity to show his truly amazing knowledge and memory regarding production figures, technical data of armaments, etc. In a discussion in which Hitler stood on the point of view that the abandonment of the Donbass all or part of it would mean an appreciable loss for our military economy and at the same time a decisive gain for the Russians. And I insisted on the operational necessity of equalising the front to the Mayas. I finally had only one trump card left. Shortly before my flight to Letzen, I had at my headquarters the chairman of the Presidium of the Imperial Coal Association, Paul Pleiger. I asked him about the real importance of the Donbass for our war industry and for the enemy's industry. He told me that the possession of the coal district of Shakti, that is, that part of the Donbass which lay east of the Mayas, 
was not decisive. The coal mined there was neither suitable for coking nor for our steam locomotives. To this objection from the point of view of war economy Hitler could not oppose anything. But if anyone thinks that Hitler was beaten by this argument, he underestimates the persistence of this man. He finally invoked the weather to at least achieve a delay in the evacuation of troops from the Don Donate's Ark. Indeed, in these days, unusually early for southern Russia, the period of cold weather was replaced by a thaw. The icy road through the Bay of Taganrog became almost unusable. Although the Don and Donets were still covered with ice, but at any moment it was possible that the ice due to the continuing thaw would break open. Hitler eloquently described to me that maybe in a few days the wide valley of the Don would become an insurmountable obstacle, as a consequence of which the enemy will not undertake any offensive until early summer. On the other hand, our fourth tank army on the road to the west will get bogged down in mud. I must therefore at least wait. But when I remained in my opinion and stated that I could not put the fate of my group in dependence on the hope of a premature thaw, Hitler finally agreed to reduce the eastern section of the group to the boundary of the Mayas. Our conversation, including discussion and organisational issues, lasted from 17 to 21 hours, that is, four hours. How stubbornly he held his opinion shows a small touch at our parting. After he finally agreed with my operational plan, when I was about to leave the room, he called me back. He said that he certainly did not intend to change anything about the decision he had already made, but he was very insistent in asking me to consider whether I might not be able to wait a little longer after all. Maybe the opening of the ice on the Don would allow to save the Don Donitz Ark, but my decision was firm. I told him that I would issue an order the day after my return, if the situation did not force me to do it immediately. I have dwelt so much on this conversation with Hitler, not only because it was decisive for the outcome of this winter campaign, but also because it seems to me typical of Hitler's position and shows how difficult it was to get his consent to what is not in accordance with his wishes. It is wrong to believe that with the receipt of Hitler's consent to the abandonment of the eastern Donbass and with the now possible transfer of the 4th Panzer Army to the western flank was already eliminated the actual crisis on the southern flank of the army. The transfer of the 4th Tank Army from the eastern to the western flank due to the great distance and the condition of the roads was to last about two weeks. It was still unclear whether Golitz group would reach the positions on the Mayas due to the fact that the enemy was already on its deep flank at Voroshilovgrad south of the Donets. It was also doubtful that the 1st Tank Army would hold or restore the front on the middle Donets, but above all, events were unfolding threateningly in the area of Army Group B, that is, in the area of Kharkov, which opened wide prospects for the enemy. He could break through not only to the crossings across the Dnieper near Dnipropetrovsky and Zaporozhye to cut off the communications of Army Group Don, but also to reach the Dnieper upstream, force it and cut it off from the west. It became necessary, along with the transfer of the 4th Panzer Army to the western flank of the group, to form a new grouping in place of the almost completely out-of-service armies of the Allied armies operating in the Group B. February 7th in the afternoon, I again arrived at my headquarters in Stalin. On the Don, the situation had been aggravated by the capture by the Russians of Batysk, a suburb of Rostov on the south bank. Immediately after my arrival, the command of the group gave the order to withdraw behind the Don and began the transfer of the 4th Panzer Army and the divisions at our disposal at the moment on the western flank. Golitz group was ordered to withdraw first to the line novichokask kamensk On February 8th, again created a crisis near Rostov and Voroshilovgrad, where the enemy broke through from the bridgehead won by him in due time. In the strip of the 1st Tank Army advancing on the Middle Donets River, we could also talk about a crisis, because it had not yet achieved the expected success in the battles against the enemy advancing across the Donets River to Lysikansk and Slaviansk, in the area of action of Group B near Kharkov, a new army group was formed under the command of General Lanz, which was subordinated to the SS Tank Corps arriving here. We learned that the SS Division Reich, which was supposed to repel the enemy at Volchansk to then move southeast toward Isium, did not defeat the enemy. Moreover, it itself withdrew behind Donitz. It was clear that under such conditions nothing would come out of Hitler's planned strike of the SS Panzer Corps, of which there was still only a Division Reich, in order to alleviate the situation on our western flank. 
February 9th. The enemy seized north of Kharkov, Belgorod and Kursk. He was advancing from the Ark of the Donets near Isium to the west, practically in the gap between the Dnieper and the right flank of Army Group Centre, which began much north of Kursk, acted only Lance's group, whose attack on Kharkov was already doubtful, and west of Kursk badly battered 2nd Army of Army Group B. Since this situation gave the enemy the opportunity to carry out a deep bypass manoeuvre across the Dnieper above Dnepropetrovsk, it was clear that our army group will not be able to long provide their own forces, despite the transfer of the 4th Tank Army to the western flank for the security of their rear communications. It was necessary to take some drastic measures. In a telegram to General Zeitzler, I demanded therefore the concentration of a new army of at least five to six divisions within two weeks in the area north of Dnepropetrovsky, as well as the concentration of another army behind the front of the second army, that is, in the area west of Kursk to strike to the south. For this purpose, a radical improvement in the supply service was necessary. The partial arrival of individual divisions at a slow pace, as had hitherto been the case, did not meet the requirements of the situation. General Zeitzler promised me now substantial assistance. He hoped to remove at last six divisions from the front of Group Centre and North and to transfer them to us at a faster pace than had hitherto been the case. He promised to give daily about 37 military echelons, which meant that every other day would arrive one of the promised divisions. Of course, even these forces in view of the great width of the gap could only be a temporary solution, which would have saved us from serious dangers at best until the onset of the thaw. Whether it would be timely depended on the development of the situation at Kharkov, on which our group had no influence. In any case, the shadow of mortal danger continued to hang over the southern flank of the Eastern Front, because the enemy before or immediately after the thaw could break through to the coast of the Sea of Azov, or even deeper to the coast of the Black Sea. If the group was mainly concerned with its deep flank, developments on its own fronts were not reassuring. The first tank army, which had the task of once again pushing back behind the river the enemy, who had broken through the middle Donets, was fighting two superior groups. One strong group crossed the Donets near Voroshilovgrad and tried to break through between Holitz group retreating to the Mayas and the first tank army advancing from the south to the Donets. The second group of the enemy crossed Donets on the line lysikansk slaviansk and sought to direct the main blow to our western flank in the area on both sides of Krivoy Tors. This created the danger of two-way coverage of the first tank army. She had to try to break the enemy groups one by one. According to the command of the group, the direction of the main blow of the army should have been on its western flank in order to first smash the enemy at Slavyansk and then turn against the grouping at Voroshilovgrad. But however, the development of the situation forced the army part of its forces first to fight with the second grouping of the enemy. The army was therefore not strong enough to quickly defeat the enemy at Slavyansk, but south of Voroshilovgrad, there were no forces to stop the enemy's breakthrough to the southwest. As always, in this already critical situation, there are also private failures. The first tank army, planning combat operations of its forces to destroy the enemy advancing from Slavyansk, established on the basis of intelligence that the advance of its tank formations in the area west of Krivaya Torets to conduct an operation to envelop the enemy is impossible. The terrain, cut by deep ravines, was covered with such deep snow that the use of our tank forces was excluded. Therefore, 40 TK began its offensive along the valley Krivoy Torets and east of it almost frontally. As it happens almost always in the harsh Russian winter, it is impossible to leave units to spend the night outside populated areas and the actions of this corps led to the fact that the battles were essentially played out in the Valley Krivoy Torets only for populated areas. First of all, it was a question of mastering the large industrial city of Kramatorsk. In such a battle, we could not expect such a necessary quick success against the enemy grouping at Slavyansk. Acting here, 11 TD moved forward slowly. The plan of the group to cut off the enemy from the Donets by covering from the west thus turned out to be futile, and the enemy for his part on the night of February 11th broke through the supposedly impassable terrain west of Krivoy Torts to Grishino with large tank forces. This episode showed once again that the Western notions of impassable terrain for the Russians have only a very limited meaning. Wide tracks of their tanks made it much easier to overcome obstacles, which were for our tanks mud or deep snow. 
In the area of Grishino, the enemy was not only deep in the flank of the first tank army, but he also cut there, at the same time, the main communication of the troop, leading from Dnepropetrovsk Krasnomiskoi. Only the road through Zaporozhye remained, but its capacity was limited because the big bridge over the Dnieper near Zaporozhye, destroyed by the enemy in 1941, had not been restored yet. Tanks with fuel could not be brought to the front. The supply of the front, especially fuel, was thus in danger of being disrupted, and there was a danger that the first tank army would be covered from the west at this time the enemy was also trying to strike it from the east by forces that had broken through Voroshilovgrad. One enemy cavalry corps succeeded in breaking through to the important railroad junction of Dibaltsevo, which lay deep in the rear of the right flank of the first tank army, and also beyond the river frontier, which was to be seized by Hollitz group. This corps was, however, surrounded at Dibaltsevo, but its destruction was a difficult matter and was slow, as it offered stubborn resistance in populated areas. 17 TD, which was so much needed on the western flank of the army, was here at first constrained. Meanwhile, the enemy strongly pressed on the eastern section of the front replenished tank units Golitz group, retreating to the Mayas, so it was impossible to take a tank division from it. Still let us say here in advance Golitz group managed to reach Mayas on February 17th and organise defence there. On the western flank, by introducing into the battle, came from the Don Division Viking managed at this time to suspend enemy tanks at Grishino but the division failed to quickly destroy the enemy. Not to mention the fact that the division was severely weakened in the previous heavy fighting, it felt a great lack of commanders. The division was composed of SS volunteers from the Baltic and Nordic countries. Its losses were so great that it lacked officers with adequate language skills. It is therefore understandable that the combat effectiveness of this good unit was low. The 4th Tank Army was still on the march at this time, and partly moved by transport from the lower Don to the western flank. Great difficulties with the roads greatly delayed its movement. If we do not even consider the fact that the enemy at Grishino was already deeply hovering over the flank of the first tank army, and the possibility that he could throw fresh forces to these halted compounds, the danger in the second gap, formed between the left flank of the first tank army and the Kharkov area, was still very serious. Here the enemy had complete freedom of action. These crises in the Army Group area were mainly the result of the fact that Army Group Don had been forced to leave its forces for too long to cover the withdrawal of Army Group uh, ahead of the Don and Donitz. Now the Group Command had to look with increasing concern at the site of Group B, since the Group B. After the withdrawal of the Allied armies consisted only of the Second Army, fighting west of Kursk, and a badly battered newly formed group of Lantz, standing in the area of Kharkov, then for the Russians opened here two opportunities, equally dangerous for Army Group Don. The enemy could, having set up cover near Kharkov, turn the advancing forces, according to our information, from Izium westward to Pavlograd and further to the Dnieper crossings near Dmepropetrovsk and Zaporozhye, and thus cut off the rear of Army Group Don near the Dnieper. He, furthermore, even had the opportunity, in addition, to try to defeat the Lance Group, which was still in the stage of formation. If the enemy succeeded in doing this, he would have a way across the Dnieper on both sides of Kremenchug. Then he could cut off both the approaches to the Crimea and the crossing of the Dnieper at Kherson. As a result, he would have encircled the entire southern flank of the German army. And even if the thaw, which usually comes at the end of March, would have postponed these broad operations, it had to be assumed that the enemy would resume this operational objective immediately after the end of the thaw period. For these reasons, I sent on February 12th, Og to report to Hitler my new assessment of the situation. On the basis of the above-mentioned considerations, coming from the prospects available to us, I put first of all two points. First, the balance of forces. I stated that, although the enemy for the past three months in the course of offensive fighting obviously tried to achieve decisive success on the Eastern Front by defeating or cutting off the German southern flank, the distribution of forces on the Eastern Front on the German side, as before, they in no way met the requirements of the situation. Despite the fact that in recent months Army Group Don received the replenishment of several divisions, the ratio of German forces and enemy forces, as on the front of Group B, remains 1 8, 
while the ratio on the fronts of the group centre and north was 1-4. Of course it is understandable that the OK was afraid of creating a new aggravation of the situation here by withdrawing forces from both groups. It was, furthermore, true that the OK replied to my previous reports that almost all the available replenishment of personnel and material went to the Don group, and that the combat effectiveness of the units of the centre and north groups was less than that of the Don group. To this, however, it could be objected that the divisions of the Don group had been engaged in continuous heavy fighting for several months, which was not the case in the two northern groups. In addition, our divisions fought in the open, while those groups occupied equipped positions. But the decisive fact was that the enemy was not looking for success in the section of the group centre or on the northern flank of the German Eastern Front, but on the southern wing, and therefore could not continue to infringe on our interests with regard to the distribution of forces. It could be unmistakably assumed that in the event that we were able to avoid the grave danger of being cut off from crossing the Dnieper, the enemy would still not abandon his far-reaching goal of destroying the German southern flank by encircling it near the sea coast. Therefore, we had to carry out under all circumstances a serious improvement in the distribution of forces on the southern flank, regardless of whether in this case we'll have to give up other areas or theatres of war or not. In addition to this fundamental question of the general distribution of forces, which I put for consideration in the report which contained the assessment of the situation, I expressed in it to the OK also my considerations on the further conduct of operations on the southern flank of the Eastern Front. This will be discussed in the next chapter, Citadel. On the night of February 12th, I moved my headquarters of the group, now called Army Group South, in Zaporozhye, to keep in hand the leadership of operations in the decisive in the near future section. On the night of February 13th, my headquarters received an instruction from the OK, apparently a decision on my proposal of February 9th. According to this instruction, in accordance with my proposal, one army was to deploy on the line poltava Dnepropetrovsk, the other behind the southern flank of the Second Army. In fact, the matter did not come to the receipt of these two armies. The army, which was to deploy behind the Second Army, did not arrive at all. The Second Army in general received reinforcements, but all this was done at the expense of the replenishment that was supposed to us. The army that was to deploy at the line of poltava Dnepropetrovsk was constrained and already drawn into the battle group Lance. This group was then subordinated to the group South at the same time with the transfer of the section of the group B up to and including Belgorod. Two army was transferred to the group centre, the headquarters of the group B was liquidated as a link of the Eastern Front.